Thank you for that introduction, Bruce, and uh, I look forward to sharing with all of you my PhD work, which is titled uh, Light-Dependent Growth Kinetics and Mathematical Modeling of Synecocystis Species PCC 6803. But before I dive into that, I'd like to give you a little background information about the uh, motivation behind this work. So as many of you know, the sun emits electromagnetic radiation, which reaches the Earth's surface primarily in the form of infrared radiation, visible light and uh, ultraviolet radiation. Now some of the visible light and ultraviolet radiation is absorbed by the Earth's surface and re-emitted as lower energy infrared radiation into space. However, Earth has an atmosphere made up of certain gases that will absorb the uh, infrared radiation, therefore warming the Earth's surface. And this is a good thing because it's the reason that the Earth is a good temperature to sustain life. However, one of those gases, carbon dioxide, since uh, the Industrial Revolution, humankind has been releasing or digging fossil carbon out of the ground, burning it for energy, and drastically increasing the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration. So this is two plots. The bottom is looking at the cumulative anthropogenic CO2 emissions, and then the plot above it is uh, global average temperature, and as you can see, um, they trend upward together, and as we continue to release carbon dioxide into the, or increase the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration, the global average temperature will continue to rise. And this is problematic because it will cause uh, glacial and Antarctic ice melting, which will raise sea levels. Um, there will be a disruption to the gro global hydrologic cycle, um, so there will be increased evaporation and increased precipitation in different areas, therefore changing weather patterns and a redistribution of water around the globe. And this is problematic because um, it can have societal and ecological consequences. This is a simplified uh, representation of the global carbon, natural carbon cycle. There's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, then plants and some bacteria that can perform photosynthesis fix the carbon into organic carbon. Then other organisms eat the organic carbon for energy and re-release it into the atmosphere. And of course, when we dig carbon that's been buried in the earth for 100,000 years and burn it for energy, we increase this flux of carbon to the atmosphere but don't balance it um, with a similar sink. So one solution to this is to um, stop using fossil carbon for energy. And the goal of our team has been to look at how to increase photosynthesis and then use uh, photosynthetic products as energy. 
In particular, we look at what we call microalgae, which I use to collectively refer to single-celled eukaryotic algae and cyanobacteria. But what they are is aquatic, single-celled, microscopic organisms that can perform oxygenic photosynthesis. So on the right, this is an electron microscopy image of Cynicocystis, which is the organism that we work with. And on the left, this is a raceway pond from the ASU Polytechnic campus showing an uh, example of how we might be able to cultivate these organisms. Now, the advantage that they have over plants is that they can have a higher growth rate. Um, they don't need arable land, which is to say that they don't need good soil to grow. Um, and also, you can produce a variety of products from them. For example, um, different types of fuel. You can produce uh, animal and fish feed, and also certain higher value products. Um, people eat different strains of algae for health benefits, and also um, some algae products are used for cosmetics. Now, the largest opportunity to restabilize the carbon cycle would, of course, be to make algae-derived fuel. But uh, any application where it either reduces the energy input or replaces the synthetic process would reduce the flux of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. But in order to um, use, realize the potential of microalgae, we need to be able to grow them as efficiently as possible. So a mantra in our research center that we like to say is work for microorganisms so that they will work for you. And so what that means in the case of microalgae is we want to give them a happy home to grow in and then they will grow as fast as they can and produce a valuable product for us. So the mechanisms that control um, photosynthesis, I'll outline briefly, um, they need an aquatic environment, um, they need different nutrients provided in a growth media, they need a good temperature, uh, they need neighbors that are not going to eat them, and they of course need light. So light is the piece of this puzzle that um, I primarily focused on in my uh, dissertation work. I've also done some work on phosphorus, but I won't present on that today. Um, light is foundational in our understanding of photosynthesis and also the energy source that we're trying to capture. So as I said earlier, the um, title of my dissertation is Light Dependent Growth Kinetics and Mathematical Modeling of Synecosystem Species PCC 6803. Now, a mathematical model is uh, a very useful tool in interpreting uh, microbial kinetics. And what it does is use mathematical representations of biochemical, chemical, and transport processes to understand what's going on. So in my, uh, so in my work to understand light, I've looked at different uh, this, I, I've, I've looked at different changes in light intensity uh, related to this series of experiments with uh, changing light intensity and used mathematical modeling to interpret how these experiments, what's happening in these experiments. So um, the first part is uh, continuous light steady state growth, basically shining a constant light on, on Synecocystis and seeing how fast it grows. Uh, second is a light step change. So when you change this light intensity, what is the dynamic response of growth of the organism? Then the flashing light, basically looking at what happens when these changes in light are more rapid. And then finally, uh, mixing throughout a concentrated culture, um, how does the how is growth affected as it changes from the intense light at the surface of a culture versus the shaded or um, darker into a microalgae culture. So for my experimental methods, I used this photobioreactor, um, which has an LED light panel in the back, which I can control the light intensity it delivers to the culture. This is the main experimental parameter that I'm going to address today. Um, the reactor can also uh, control the temperature, which I've set at a constant 30 degrees. Um, I also control the pH and inorganic carbon in the system by bubbling CO2 into it. Um, the culture stays mixed either by uh, an air diffuser or a mechanical mixer. And an important um, uh, ability that this reactor has is to measure uh, these two parameters, the optical density at 680 and the optical density at 735. Optical density is basically how much light at that wavelength can the biomass absorb. 
So in the case of 680, 680 nanometers, that is in red light, and it's an absorption peak for chlorophyll. So it's essentially a measure of how much pigmentation is in the reactor. Um, 735 is in the near infrared and therefore sort of an analog for turbidity. And in fact, I use optical density at 735 as an approximation of biomass concentration. So in my modeling work, I have addressed five state variables. So a state variable is a mathematical representation of some state that the biomass is in. So the first uh, state variable operator has, is absorbed light. So all photosynthetic organisms have pigmentation that can absorb light. So when a photon of light energy comes in contact with a pigment and it's absorbed, an electron in that pigment becomes excited. That excitation energy is then passed along until it reaches a photosystem. And in the photosystem, that energy is stored into an electron. These um, energized electrons are then put into electron carriers. So this is essentially what this absorbed pool of light is. Um, the next uh, state variable is photoacclimation. So microalgae have the ability to change their molecular composition in response to the light intensity that they're experiencing. And as I'll show later, a prime example of this is that under um, low light conditions, dim light, they want to absorb as much light as possible. So they increase their pigmentation level, whereas at very high light, they actually want to reduce the amount of photo damage they take. So um, they reduce their pigmentation, which brings me to the uh, third state variable, which is, which is photosystem 2 photo damage. So um, oxygenic photosynthesis is made up of two photosystems, photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. And one of the main differences between the two is where they get their electrons from. So in photosystem 2, the electrons come from the oxygen evolving complex. In the oxygen evolving complex, water is split, releases electrons to um, photosystem 2, and releases oxygen. And uh, in photosystem one, electrons come from photosystem two. So for every photon of light absorbed by the pigment, pigmentation, um, there's approximately a one in a million chance that it will generate a free radical, which can go on and dam damage the photosynthetic machinery. And in particular, uh, the target is thought to be the oxygen evolving complex. So because this happens under all levels of illumination, there is a natural damage and repair cycle of, um, of the oxygen evolving complex, um, which, is in, which is typically in balance if the, if the light is unchanging. However, when there is an excess of light absorbed in excess of what the photoacclimated condition is, the repair mechanism of photosyst photosystem 2 can be inhibited, which is the fourth state variable that I have up here. Now, if the amount of light absorbed is in a large excess of the photoacclimated condition, there can be damage to photosystem one. And the mechanism for this is that um, if there's this large amount of light absorbed, there's this big slug of electrons that travels from photosystem two to photosystem one, which causes damage to it. Now, there is not a natural damage and repair cycle to this. So um, repair of photosystem one can take on the order of days to weeks. And I don't actually address photosystem one repair in any of my work. Uh, so now I'd like to talk about um, an important concept in growing cultures of uh, microalgae or cyanobacteria. And that is light attenuation, which is basically the idea that as you shine a light into a culture, um, the light intensity decreases as you pass through this suspension of particles, which are in this case microalgae. So you can see this is sort of a profile of the light intensity plotted against depth. And this can be described by an exponential function dependent on what's called an extinction coefficient. Extinction coefficient is basically based on the light scattering and absorption of the particle. Um, the particle concentration or biomass concentration in this and the depth of the reactor. So as the culture grows more concentrated, you know, as they grow, there's more biomass in the system, the attenuation profile moves in this direction. Similarly, if the extinction coefficient changes, um, it would transition in this direction. 
So here I've measured this extinction coefficient, um, and I did that. The extinction coefficient is plotted in the y-axis. I did that by shining a light through a petri dish of culture and measuring how much light passes through that. And I uh, measured that for cultures acclimated to a wide range of light intensities. And what you see is that the extinction coefficient starts higher at low light and then decreases. And the primary mechanism for this is that they want to absorb more light, as much light as possible when they are light limited, whereas as out here they want to reduce the amount of excess photo damage they take. Um, so the extinction coefficient is strongly related to the photoacclimated light condition. And I take this a step further and say that we can describe the photoacclimated condition by using the extinction coefficient. And in my modeling work, that is in fact the parameter that I use for uh, photoacclimation. So this is a flow diagram of my, the model that I developed. Um, you'll see that each of the state variables is here. And uh, later when I show you plots of these variables, um, I keep these colors consistent. So try to keep things consistent. Um, but basically, the way the model works is that the pool of absorbed light is dependent on both the photoacclimated state and the incident light intensity. Then photoacclimation changes in response to how much light is absorbed. Um, photosystem 2 photo damage occurs according to how much light is absorbed, provided that the photoacclimation state is uh, balanced with absorbed light. But if the amount of absorbed light is in excess of photoacclimation, there is photosystem 2 repair inhibition. And then if there's a large excess of absorbed light, there is photosystem 1 photo damage. And these both lead to a net increase in photosystem 2 photo damage. And finally, the level of phototrophic growth is dependent on the level of photosystem 2 photo damage and absorbed light. Now, in this presentation, I'm not going to focus on the map behind these interactions, but you will see a lot of, uh, of interactions through the plots that I've generated to see how, how this plays out. So the first thing to look at is uh, steady state continuous light growth. And so up here I have a specific growth rate, and down here I have photoacclimation and photosystem 2 photo damage for a range of levels of absorbed light. Um, so first looking at specific growth rate, you see uh, characteristic regions of the plot uh, that are, are commonly published in, in uh, growth irradiance curves in the literature. But down here, there's a region of light limitation where additional light causes additional growth. Up here, it transitions into light saturation where additional light does not cause additional growth. And then finally, out here, it's a region of photo inhibition where um, additional light actually causes a decrease in growth. And the model explains these trends in the graph through the combination of this decreasing photoacclimation and increase in photosystem 2 photo damage. Before I show you some data to validate uh, that model curve, I'd like to explain a few things about how I collected the specific growth rate. Um, so, you know, as I said earlier, I used the optical density at 735 to approximate the dry weight. And then as you track a culture growing over time, it increases something like this. But as I also said, um, the attenuation profile can change as the biomass concentration increases. So in fact, what I did is set the um, bioreactor that I used to range of biomass concentrations so that it operates in the sequencing batch reactor formulation. So it grows up, is diluted, and then grows again. Um, you can see that there is uh, some level of noise among these points. So um, in computing the specific growth rate, I took the average of each growth period. Um, and then for steady state conditions, I took the average of all of these for a whole day. And for the dynamic response, which I'll show you later, um, I use a da dash over the time period of the growth period to, to represent that, that growth rate. So here's the data for the um, steady state uh, growth irradiance curve. You can see that the model tracks the data fairly well. Um, I'd also point out that this is, in fact, where a lot of light-dependent growth models stop. 
They just have light in, growth out. But when I look at the dynamic response of a step change in light, there is, in fact, some very interesting trends. So um, here I have the specific growth rate plotted in the y-axis, time in the x-axis. And what I did is I grew the culture at a constant light intensity for a day. And then at time one day, I increased the light. So for all of these step change experience experiments, I've plotted it so that the change in light happens at one day. But what happens is that the, um, there's a relatively constant growth rate at the first light condition, you know, a steady state growth. Then there's a spike in growth after the light change, followed by a depression, and then a restabilization of the growth. So this is how the model interprets and explains what's happening. So first looking at photoacclimation, after the light change, it begins to photoacclimate to the new steady state condition. But during this transition period, there's an onset of photosystem to repair inhibition. That in turn leads to an excess of photosystem to photo damage, which then restabilizes as the repair inhibition um, goes away. And ultimately here is the uh, specific growth rate trend that you see where there's a spike in growth related to the initial low level of photosystem 2 photo damage and excess of light absorbed, but that quickly goes away as the excess of photosystem 2 photo damage catches up and then restabilizes. Now, in this light step, um, it's not extreme enough to show photosystem 1 photo damage, but I will show you that later. Um, before I show data related to these experiments, um, I'd like to quickly go over this. Um, in here, I've plotted the optical density at 680 to optical density at 735 ratio. And basically, as I said earlier, optical density at 680 is kind of an approximation of, uh, of pigmentation in the culture, and 735 is an approximation of biomass. So as this increases, there's an increased level of pigment, pigment per biomass. Now, the extinction coefficient uh, is sort of an approximation of the same thing. They're not the same measure, but they are, they're similar, so you can see that they trend upward. And the reason that I point this out is because, as I said, the bioreactor automatically measures this, whereas this I have to measure by hand. So that's, in fact, uh, the way that I fit the rate of photoacclimation. As you can see up here, the ratio is 680 to 735, and then also the um, model parameter for photoacclimation, and they track fairly well. Also, when you look at the specific growth rate, you can see that the model also tracks that pretty well, showing all the same features. So next, I'll show you a decreasing step in light. Um, first, looking at photoacclimation after the state, we'll notice that this rate is much slower than for the increasing light. And uh, that's something that's been shown in the literature and my dad also supports. But basically, the, assumption, the, the idea there is that when you're going to a lower light, the biomass is trying to increase pigmentation, which takes more energy, versus going to a higher light, they're trying to decrease, which is much easier. Um, then here's the PS2 photo damage, where there's an initially a higher level. And then after the change in light, it drops down and restabilizes. And then finally, specific growth rate steady state. Uh, this drop is related to this initial high level of photosystem 2 photo damage. Then it restabilizes. And here's some data for that. Um, this isn't the best representation of the rate of photoacclimation, but you'll have to take my word for it that of all the decreasing light steps that I conducted, uh, this was a good average of the rate of it. But an interesting thing about this um, OD 68735 data is that it shows this sort of cycling. And uh, I don't investigate this further, but my, um, my assumption is that it's related to a circadian effect that is uh, activated under these decreasing light conditions. Um, but then down here, you can see the specific growth rate, which shows the steady state here, and then the restabilization there. So now um, I'll show you what happens during an intense step in light. So the white curve is the previous light step experiment that I showed you, and then the colored curves are this new um, step in light, which is to a more intent, intense light intensity. 
first step was 75 to 300, and now this is 75 to 1,000. But what you see is that immediately after the change in light, there's this onset of photosystem 1 photo damage. That in turn leads to this permanent level of repair inhibition, and then finally a higher level of photosystem 2 photo damage. So looking at the specific growth rate, there's initially the spike, just like we saw before, but it's higher because there's a larger excess of light being absorbed. And then it restabilizes to a lower specific growth rate despite being a lot more light. So looking at some data for that, um, again, photoacclimation seems to track the data pretty well. Um, and here's a specific growth rate, tracks pretty well. The important thing to point out here is that if, when I model this out without the inclusion of photosystem 1 photo damage, um, this is the curve that it looks. So there is, in fact, a large depression in growth when they experience these extreme uh, transitions in light. Uh, so now moving on to uh, flashing light. Um, I've already shown you this plot, but basically to reemphasize that, you know, when you have a concentrated culture of cyanobacteria, there is a, there can be a large gradient of light between the back and front. And as cultures mix between the front and back of this reactor, they can have these rapid transitions in light. And a controlled way to study that is to look at flashing light. And what I mean when I say that is basically that there is a period of light with intermediate periods of dark in between in this sort of, sort of step function. So the first example of this that I'd like to show is with six hours of light and six hours of dark. And yes, I'm aware that that is stretching the definition of a flash, but uh, it's, it's important, or I, I think it's important to show this because um, it exemplifies that at, at this resolution, I can measure the changes in specific growth rate, and it exemplifies that the model does, in fact, capture this repeating uh, spike in growth followed by depression and then uh, decay during the dark and restabilization, which repeats in both the model and experimental results. And you can also see down here the absorbed light level, which mostly tracks the uh, incident light, but uh, with a small effect from photoacclimation. But what happens if you crunch this down to a one second flash instead of six hour? Well, in fact, what happens is that the absorbed light becomes very important because at this time scale, there's not time for it to completely uh, reach saturation or to completely deplete the amount of absorbed light energy. And then consequently, you also see the specific growth rate transitioning between a narrower range. And in fact, as you decrease the flash duration further, this smooths out even more in this sort of blending of the light and dark periods. Looking at some data for this, I have the steady state specific growth rate um, for experiments ranging six orders of magnitude of the flash durations. Um, this one right here is the, the six hour trial that I showed you. Um, then yellow line is the model. And then this dotted line is um, the model result for continuous light at the same um, amount of light being delivered. And the, the model tracks the data pretty well. You see this, uh, it approaches the level of continuous light as the flashes get really short um, and then decreases gradually. Um, I should also point out that for all these trials, the duration of the light period and the dark period is the same amount of time. So now how does the model explain what's going on? So here I have the four state variables. Um, this doesn't have any photosystem one photo damage. And in each plot, there's this shaded area representing the difference between the minimum and maximum. So um, minimum being you know, during the dark and the maximum being during the light in, in this case. So basically, if you look at the level of absorbed light in flashes of duration below 0.1, the model basically predicts that it's the same as continuous light. And you can see up here that that is in fact what happens. But as the flashes get longer, there starts to be this deviation between the light and dark period, so it experiences these swings in absorbed light. That, in turn, leads to a decrease in the average amount of absorbed light, decrease in photoacclimation, increase of photosystem 2 repair inhibition, which therefore increase in P2 
PS2 photo damage and decrease in uh, specific growth rate. And you also see as you get really long flashes that there starts to be swings in photoacclimation, which again leads to an increase in photosystem 2 photo damage and a further decrease in growth. Um, one other thing to point out is that the experimental results seem to be a fairly gradual transition, whereas the model kind of represents this step function. And my explanation for that is that the model only represents one, um, one pool of absorbed light energy, whereas in photosynthesis there are a number of intermediate electron and energy carriers. And I suspect that depending on the flash duration, it can affect which, uh, which um, energy or, light or, or electron carrier is the rate limiting factor. So, as I said, the previous light, the flashing light experience were all equal parts light and equal parts dark. So here I'm looking at what happens when you change the ratio of light to dark. And that's represented by the duty cycle, which is the uh, amount of light, or the time in the light, divided by the time in the light and the time in the dark. So all the previous data was, you know, half and half, so 0.5 right here. Um, now these all have the same total amount of light being delivered to them. So in fact, the light is twice as strong at a duty cycle of 0.2 as it is at 0.4, but it's only exposed for half the time. Um, but looking at the specific growth rate, there are two uh, big tr uh, trends to observe. First off, as you decrease the duty cycle, there is a decrease in growth. And the other trend is that as you increase or the period in light, there is also a decrease in growth. Um, in fact, when you look at light periods of 0.01 seconds, the model predicts a complete blending between the light and dark. Now, this isn't exactly what's represented by my data. You can see these, these circles here. But um, again, I would attribute this to maybe possibly a different uh, intermediate. That's a light pool that's affecting that. But the, um, the same mechanisms controlling this decrease seem to be true for this work, that there is a decrease in the absor average absorbed light, which corresponds to a larger range between the light and dark period, and then ultimately more PS2 photo damage. So now moving on to uh, mixing in concentrated cultures, again returning to this idea of light attenuation, um, the, the flashing light experiments are very valuable in capturing these rapid transitions with rapid changes in light, but what they don't capture is intermediate light levels that a culture might experience in a concentrated culture. So in this work, I assumed a culture or a biomass is mixing within a culture in this sawtooth pattern, where here's the illuminated surface and this is the dark back of the reactor, and then you can compute the uh, light intensity corresponding to that depth in the reactor depending on the biomass concentration. So here I've uh, plotted a range of mixing speeds um, here, and then I compare it to the flashing light work. I normalize them to uh, the flashing light period, and I do this by assuming that uh, the transition from the front of the reactor to the back of the reactor and back again is equivalent to the period of light and dark for the flashing experiments. What you see is that they both follow the same trend, this, this step function um, around one second, but with the mixing experiments, it doesn't uh, plateau as low, and that's related to these intermediate lights that aren't, aren't as uh, hard on the biomass as the, uh, as the flashing light, which goes from zero to intense. Um, also, the mechanisms appear to be the same. Again, decreasing absorbed light which uh, leads to uh, increasing the difference between the range of light and dark and ultimately more photosystem to photo damage. So next, uh, looking at how the biomass concentration affects growth. Um, here is uh, the biomass concentration. And what you see is that biomass concentration increases, the model predicts, a decrease in growth. However, if you mix the culture very rapidly, you can blend the light and dark and essentially eliminate that effect. 
Um, now, here I put numbers for a duty cycle. Another way to think about the duty cycle is take the average light intensity divided by the incident light intensity, which is sort of the same as uh, the time in the light divided by the time in the light and time in the dark. So I, I say that this is an uh, equivalent duty cycle for these biomass concentrations. But what you see is, you know, as biomass concentration increases, duty cycle decreases, and therefore relating this back to the flashing light work, this also agrees with uh, lower duty cycle leads to lower growth. Now this is a table with some experimental results for uh, cultures of different biomass concentration and different incident light intensity. I also have the equated duty cycle up here. Now in these experiments, I used a mechanical mixer that I can set the mixing rate. So in all trials, I did both a trial with a higher mixing speed and a lower mixing speed. And what you see when you compare all of these is that the higher mixing speed always led to a uh, higher specific growth rate in agreement with the model. The other thing to point out is that if you look at all the higher mixing speed trials and compare them with the equated duty cycle, you'll see that the specific growth rate declines along with the duty cycle. Now I will point out that when I model out these specific situations using that sawtooth mixing, the model results do not match the, uh, the measured experimental results. However, the model does uh, represent the trends. Now, I, I, I haven't been able to resolve what this discrepancy is, but I suspect that it's some, either something inherently different with uh, concentrated cultures, or there is some community effect that is not addressed by the model. So in conclusion, I developed this light-dependent mathematical model considering these five state var variables, absorbed light, photoacclimation, photosystem 2 photo damage, photosystem 2 repair inhibition, and photosystem 1 photo damage. I'll also point out that uh, no other light model exists considering these two variables. So in fact, that dip that I observed after the step in light has not been captured by any other model and the stabilization to a lower level as a result of ex excess damage has not been captured by any other model. But then I used this model to interpret these experimental results and explain how these uh, trends happen, including continuous light, uh, step changes in light, uh, flashing light, and mixing throughout a concentrated culture. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that this uh, research could go, but uh, some specific future work that I've sort of alluded to in the presentation are, first off, incorporating multiple pools of absorbed light to possibly further explain some of the uh, flashing light results. Next is to resolve the issue with uh, the biomass concentration work. Um, there's, I have an in, there's, there's some ways that you can try and tease out whether, you know, if, if you make the attenuation profile the same but at a lower biomass concentration, you could see if there is, in fact, some effect of this more dense or more concentrated culture. Uh, third up here, um, the photo damage that I report is all just sort of a modeling parameter. But uh, if... So, so there are ways that people have used to actually measure photo damage using fluorescence. Now, I don't think this would be easy, but if you could um, redo some of the experiments I did and measure the photo damage, it would, it would be valuable to um, see, to fit the model and, and make sure that it's, it's capturing things the way that they actually happen. Now, the final point up here is temperature, which is something I haven't talked at all about. Um, but if you want to take this light model outside, it's, it's essential to include. And uh, some of the effects of temperature on light are, are interesting. So for all, all biochemical and chemical reactions will slow down as temperature gets lower. But photochemical reactions could actu will, will actually occur at the same or similar rate. So in fact, there's a higher susceptibility to photo damage at lower um, lower temperatures. So in fact, the, the big picture goal of this work is to be able to take a culture outside, 
any concentration, any uh, light intensity changes, and be able to predict how much growth there is so that um, ultimately uh, it can lead to being able to maximize the light utilization of a microalgae cultivation system. So finally, acknowledgments. There are a lot of people to acknowledge, so unfortunately I don't have many names up here. But I'd like to thank everybody who's come through the photobioreactor team. Uh, they've helped with experimentation, with uh, interpretation, um, just listening to me. Uh, also, everybody in the Biodesign Sweetie Center for similar reasons. Um, all my friends and family for moral support. Uh, my funding sources. I've had a, a Dean's Fellowship from ASU College of Engineering, an NSF Eigert Fellowship, and uh, funding from the Sweetie Center. And I'd like to thank my uh, graduate supervisory committee, Dr. Rittman, uh, Dr. Fox, and Dr. Torres. I'd underscore that everything you saw, including me standing up here, would not have been possible without Dr. Rittman. Um, so finally, uh, thank you all for your support and attention. And I'd like to take any questions.
uh, I can't collect specific rate on this resolution. So uh, this was this is really sort of just an example to show how it changes when you decrease the, the uh, flash duration. Um, so there's really no significance to why it shows one second other than it's a round number, I suppose. <laughs> um, did that cover? Okay. <laughs> uh, let's go to first here. Um, so you have interesting data on your flashing experiment and then also mixing. Mm -hmm. So were you able to remove the effect of mixing during your flash experiment? Good question. I should, I should have touched on that better. Um, so for all experiments, except for the mixing experiments, uh, I kept the culture uh, fairly dilute. I mean, like, you know, around less than 200 milligrams per liter. And so through that, you know, the, the attenuation profile is fairly, it, it's not that, doesn't have that much effect. Um, yes. Um, so I have two questions. Um, First one is about the um, photosystem damage. Mm -hmm. uh, how how do you recognize the photosystem one damage and photosystem two damage? Is that based on the previous literature about the intensity of the light? Uh, second question is based on your research, your results. Do you think uh, uh, so? Right now, Polytechnic Campus they use those panels um, to uh, to grow instead of racing. Oh, they use the race bed as well, but they have on the glass panels, you know that. But do you think, based on your data, uh, is there anything that you think needs to be changed from that design? All right, good question. Uh, the first question about photo damage. Um, yeah, I mean, well, my knowledge on that mostly comes from literature, and then the work that I did um, sort of uses the, the literature knowledge to explain that I see in growth rate. Um, so, you know, I guess I'm not positive all the methods that they use of detecting photo damage in the literature. Um, I know that there's still some uncertainty about how it all happens. But uh, one, one thing that they do do is fluorescence. Um, so basically, you flash an intense light on the culture and then you measure the wavelength of light that comes back. And if that changes, if, if there's damage to something, um, and I think you can do both photo system one and photo system two that way. Um, I'm sure there's also some sort of like mass spec approach of measuring. Um, but yeah, so so that that's does that cover that question? Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, so the second question: How to improve a you know the reactors that they use at Polytech? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I, I didn't, I, I think that's going to be a uh, fairly involved <coughs> modeling exercise. Um, so, so I really was kind of focusing on, uh, first, you know, per perfecting the model in as many light conditions as I can. And then, you know, eventually you can sort of take this out the side and say, you know, here's the diurnal light pattern. If you increase the depth of the reactor, how does that affect growth and questions like that? Um, there's a lot of other <coughs> practical considerations when it comes to you know, these real cultivation systems. So for example, the raceway pond that I showed in the early slide is a much less expensive cultivation method than say a flat panel. So it's not a, a real good answer, but it, it's a very good question. <laughs> uh, so be it. Um, like you said, it uh, seems like a very complete and thorough model. So my question is, how do you feel this model would benefit industrial applications? Like, how, what's the application? Okay. Uh, so, I, I, this kind of goes along with uh, what I was just saying about uh, reactor design, and, and it is so. You know, the, the goal is to be able to capture sunlight, you know, because if, if you can control light, you're, you're the best off to, you know, just shine a continuous light on the culture. Um, but when you want to capture an outdoor light, there's sort of this unpredictableness to it. There's also really intense light in the middle of the day versus more dim light in the afternoon. So um, 
um, you could answer questions like, well, should I shade in the middle, middle of the day? Um, what concentration should I grow the biomass at so that you know, they aren't experiencing too much photo damage in the middle of the day, but uh, still getting enough light in the later in the day? Um, so that's sort of the application that I see. Yeah. Yes, my question, Garnet. <laughs> <laughs> I have another question. Another one just like that. <laughs> I got another question. Um, so the concept of uh, recycle rate or biomass is becoming popular, I think, in algae systems from what I've heard. Um, so how much biomass should you recycle in order to get, you know, good or good recovery and things like that? Um, how would you apply your model um, to describe that? Good question. Um, the, the first thing that pops into my mind is that when you have a very dilute culture, um, they get a lot more light than if there's a more concentrated culture. So um, you, you, don't, you would want to carry over enough biomass to your next run so that they don't get, uh, just take a huge amount of photo damage from getting way more light than when they were growing up the, the more dense culture. Uh, looking at your flashing experiments, you know, I've talked about this some, but it's kind of need to refresh on my mind. When you kept the light, total amount of light constant? Yeah, so can, all, all the data that I show here and here, and actually here too, sorry, um, is, yeah, same total amount of light. So how does that compare to the literature? Uh, Grove was working in the 90s when he was doing fashion that experiment. Um, I don't have a, a direct uh, comparison. I know that uh, you know one of one of the things that people like to say about flashing light is that you can improve growth in it, or, or you can improve the photosynthetic efficiency, but what they're doing then is they're, they're actually growing cultures at saturating, light saturating levels. So if you take, you know, saturating light, which is the point where, you know, additional, where, where light doesn't cause more growth. But if you then break that up and turn it into flashes, that actually sort of equals out to a lower level of light and they, they're, they're more efficiently utilize it. And uh, I, I think my model still agrees with that. The, um, I think obstacles we have as modelers is getting people to adopt our model. So I don't know if anyone else felt that way. But um, so, what are you going to do to help with adoption of this? Or what do you think would help? Yeah. Um, well, so uh, the the trend in microalgae modeling for mice has been kind of this, this different approach where they they build the organism on it. PSUs and those that they have different states. Anyway, I, I think that that whole approach is kind of an overcomplication. Um, and so, although this model considers some more variables, I think it's actually more simple and more complete. So, hopefully, people can realize that. But I guess, uh, in terms of my pushing of it, you know, I have um, the model paper itself and then. Uh, you know, an experimental paper sort of validating the model, and I hope to publish another paper on flashing light. So, I guess getting enough literature out there. <laughs> what about free access to your model? So you like code. creating a Excel file or a MATLAB? Or share Yeah, some sort of share -word. It's a good idea. Um, I can do that. So we're going to make a transition. We're going to ask the audience to leave the video today with Levi. But first of all, I do want to congratulate the audience. I've been through a lot of PhD defenses, and this is right at the top of the list of great questions from the audience. So let's, let's, let's spend a really good presentation and your research to do it. But the audience
audience was right on top of us. So let's congratulate ourselves. <laughs>